Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a very important top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell so that you can make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 reasons the church will be raptured before the Great Tribulation. It couldn't be any clearer. As Paul wrote to Titus, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 12 through 13. While we're living godly, we should also be looking for the great God-man, the Lord Jesus. But in recent years, the blessed hope has waned. People think it's controversial to talk about the coming of Christ, so they've just dropped the subject. But, adds Paul, we need to abound in hope. So let's take a good look at the certain hope of the first century church. Top 10 reasons of a often neglected subject nowadays. Number one is because the rapture is clearly taught in scripture. I think this is true, Dave. We have to clarify one thing before we start on this subject, and that is that we're not talking about will the Christians go through tribulation because the Lord Jesus made it clear in the upper room. He said, in the world you shall have tribulation. The issue is over the little word the. Will the church go through the tribulation? That is tribulation, the great one. It's clearly taught in scripture in passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now this word caught up here is the Greek word harpazo, and it was translated into Latin as the rapture. It's the same word, and our word harpoon is the idea of snatching up, to snatch a fish up out of the water, so to speak. And that's where this comes from, this idea of being snatched up. It's used for Paul's heavenly experience in 2 Corinthians 12, and it's also used of Christ's ascension to heaven in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. So this idea of being caught up, we see here that the meeting place is not on earth. It's with the Lord in the air caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air. So the idea of rapture, although the word is not in our English, it's in the Latin scriptures, but the word is translated caught up here. We, the rapture of the church is clearly taught there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Reason number two is because most of the church is already with the Lord. Right, so to say, will the church go through the tribulation seems to miss the point that most of the church is already in heaven. So the question then is, is the last generation of the church so evil and wicked compared to all the other generations that it needs this extra beating up to whip it into shape? And there's nothing in scripture that suggests such a thing. Reason number three because the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. You recall the story of Jacob, how he was running away from the Lord, and then how he was scheming and wrestling, and then how the Lord laid his hand on him and returned him. And he had this amazing interaction with the Lord in which we read he saw the face of God, and he called the name of the place Peniel. I've seen the face of God. Now, what could that mean? Well, obviously, when we throw it on the big screen, we realize that Israel, when they're away from the Lord, are referred to as Jacob. 
and Israel has gone away from the Lord. They're involved in other pursuits with very little interest in knowing the Lord. But the Lord is going to bring them back. And when he brings them back, they're going to come face to face with God. They're going to see God's face, so to speak. And they'll look on him whom they pierced, and they'll respond in faith to him. So that's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not referring to the church there. It's referring to the redeemed. Now this brings before us this very important point. If you don't distinguish between Israel and the church, then when you read about the elect in the tribulation, they must be Christians. But in actual fact, these are the chosen ones out of the nation of Israel that are being referred to. So that's a very important idea that we need to lay hold of. The tribulation is Daniel's 70th prophetic week, which is describing God's dealings with the nation of Israel. And the last week has been held in abeyance since the crucifixion of Christ during what we call the Age of Grace. And when that period is done, then God will reintroduce this 70th week of Daniel, which is the time of the tribulation. Reason number four, because the pre-tribulation rapture view is the only one that allows imminency. I think it's quite obvious that the idea of Christ's imminent return was clearly the hope of the New Testament saints. You turn to God from idols, Paul says to the Thessalonians chapter 1, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. They were not looking for the Antichrist. They were looking for Christ. So this is an important consideration because if we don't have imminency, then we can calculate when the Lord will return. Imminency is the only view. The pre-tribulation rapture is the only view that gives you imminency. The pre-wrath rapture, you can figure out if this is halfway through the weeks, through the seven-year tribulation period, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with the nation of Israel. Then all you have to do is tack on three and a half years, and you know exactly when the Lord will return to earth to establish his kingdom. So unless you have the pre-trib rapture, you don't have imminency. It's really crucial that we understand what imminency means. As soon as you say, well, the any moment coming of Christ, then you get into difficulty because people say, wait a minute, the early Christians knew that the temple had to be destroyed. They knew that Peter was going to die. There were things that they knew, so it couldn't have been imminent. But imminency does not mean that God doesn't know the time. It means that we don't know the time. But God knows. Jesus said that God has a date on his calendar. And so if God chooses to reveal to his servants certain things that will occur before the Lord's return, he's free to do that. But that doesn't change the fact that we don't know the time. And it's important for us to understand that distinction. Now, when we think about this, does Christ have two comings then? Right? And this is an argument. Say, no, there's just one coming talked about in the scripture. Now it's important to notice that the rapture is called a mystery. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, behold I show you a mystery. A mystery is a truth that God has held back from revealing until an appropriate moment. And so in the Old Testament it was a mystery. It was unknown. The coming of the Lord to earth was revealed in Daniel and Zechariah and other places. But his coming to the air to receive his people to himself, that was a mystery because the church was also a mystery in the Old Testament. We don't find the church there, so we don't find the way the church was taken out. So Christ doesn't have two comings, but two aspects of his coming. Now we see when he first came to earth, there were two comings as well. He came more or less secretly to Bethlehem. There was no announcement. A few Gentiles came, the wise men came, and there were a few shepherds given an announcement. But largely it was those looking for his coming. Whereas he came to the nation of Israel officially when he rode into the city. Behold, your king comes to you. This was the manifestation of his right to rule. And so that is a picture to us of what will happen the second time that he comes as the morning star 
only seen by those looking for the morning star, and then he comes as the son of righteousness, and his glory covers the whole earth. So understanding these two distinctions is very important. Like the two parts of the resurrections of believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have the first fruits, and then we have the general harvest. Now again, they're part of the same act of resurrection, but they're in two parts. And so it's important for us to understand that sometimes this is what occurs in the scripture. We have uh, something seen as one event, but in two parts. Uh, we have the same thing relative to the coming of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit came largely to the Jews at Pentecost, and then we have these additional scenes where he comes to the Gentiles. It's all one coming, but it's seen in various aspects. Reason number five, because we've been promised will be kept from that hour. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 explains this, that some say ek there means save through the tribulation, like Noah. But if we're going to be consistent with our typology, something happened before Noah went through the tribulation of the flood, and that was that Enoch was raptured out. And so if we are going to take that picture, we're going to understand that some of God's people will be taken out, and some of them will go through the tribulation, the people who will be taken out are the church, both the Jews and Gentiles. And the ones who will go through it will be those who are going to be saved out of the nation of Israel in the day the scripture says all Israel will be saved. Two-thirds of the Jews, according to Zechariah's calculation, will side with the Antichrist and be wiped out. But the one-third that remain true looking for the Messiah, they will all be saved when the Lord reveals himself and the beautiful words of Isaiah 53 are fulfilled. So when we think about this being saved ek, out of, which is the usual translation of the word, that the Christians will be saved out, we've been saved from wrath through him. But if it did mean saved through somehow and not out, well then the question is, why would the Lord warn his people how to flee if you see the church in Matthew 24, why would he teach them how to avoid the trouble of that time if the point of the trouble is to purify them? So it doesn't seem to make sense either way you look at it. So the tribulation is purgative, but it's purgative relative to the nation of Israel, not relative to the church. The New Testament writers admonish believers to endure present tribulation, like in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 and 14, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, all of 1 Peter, but there's absolute silence as to the Great Tribulation. There's no preparation in Scripture for Christians going through the Great Tribulation, and what should we do? Now, by contrast, in Matthew 24, he's obviously speaking to Orthodox Jews, because he speaks about not fleeing on the Sabbath day. I'll travel as far as I want on Saturday. It doesn't bother me. But an Orthodox Jew is only allowed to travel so far. And so clearly Jesus is speaking to these men, these what we call the disciples. These are representatives of the nation of Israel. They're not only part of the embryonic church, but these men are going to sit in 12 thrones in judgment over the 12 tribes. So in Matthew 24, he's communicating with them as if they are representative Israel. And I think from the context, we can clearly see that. Reason number six, because God can't restore Israel until the church is out of the way. I think this is so important that at the present time, if a Jew turns to Christ, they become part of the church. And this is the great work of Christ in taking down the middle wall of partition and making two into one. And that's, that's a, such a great mystery that Paul discusses in the book of Ephesians. So, if a Jew today turns to the Lord, they become part of the church. How then can God restore Israel if they keep adding to the church? So God is going to have to take the church out of the way so that he can then restore Israel and redeem a people out of the nation. And that really goes back to the problem if we don't distinguish between the church and Israel going into that. Uh, time of the tribulation. Right. Now, of course, there are people who have written Israel off 
And so they don't see any future for Israel and therefore they have to see the church in the tribulation. But Romans 11 makes it perfectly clear God has not given up on Israel and he's not going to give up on his covenant promises to Abraham and David relative to the nation of Israel. Reason number seven, because God recognizes only one temple at a time on earth. Now, what does that mean? Well, of course, uh, one of the things that was true of the other religions, they had shrines everywhere, they had idols, high places everywhere, but God was very specific that there would be one place of meeting. He would put his name in Jerusalem, they would build a temple, and God's presence would be known there. On one occasion when the children of Israel were moving into the land, two and a half tribes decided to stay on the other side of the river. And they decided to build an altar. And it almost caused a civil war. And these people had to talk real fast and say, whoa, wait a minute, we're not doing what you folks are doing in that time in Shiloh. Uh, this is just a little memorial to teach our children about what's happening over there in the real place where God meets with his people. And so this was a real issue. This is in Joshua chapter 22. Now at the present time, the church is the temple of the Lord on earth. And the Lord explained this to the disciples as they sat on the Mount of Olives. And he said, this temple down here is going to be utterly destroyed, not one stone left on another. And this became a great point of contention when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he was speaking about his body. Now the physical body of Christ in resurrection power is a picture of the mystical body of Christ. And we are the temple of the Lord. And again, we have that explained in Ephesians chapter 4 that the Spirit of God is building a temple out of living stones. So until the church is taken out of the way, we are the temple of God on earth. And uh, so there is going to be a temple built during the tribulation. Some people say, well, it's not recognized because it's built by the Antichrist. But God brings judgment against them and says that the Antichrist raises up an image to himself in the house of the Lord. He says, I take this personally, that you're setting up this abomination that makes desolate in the house of the Lord. So he does recognize it as the place that should be his real estate, and that has been absconded by the Antichrist. So until the church is taken out of the way, this is the only temple that God has on earth. Reason number eight, because the church is never mentioned in Revelation, after chapter 3, verse 22, until chapter 22, verse 16. All right, so we have this idea of ecclesia, the gathering together, 18 times in the first three chapters of Revelation. And then this silence. Now, of course, in 19, we see as a bride adorned for her husband, but it's not being caught up or being taken to heaven. It's coming down from heaven. And in the meantime, we have these 24 elders who I think quite clearly represent the redeemed, both perhaps the Old Testament and New Testament believers united in Christ, and there they are represented in heaven. So up to the end of chapter 3, we have this discussion of the coming of the Lord, and the last of these churches are promised the Lord's return. Then, silence. Now we see these people in heaven represented by these 24 elders and then we see them coming down from God out of heaven to earth and so during that period in between that describes the tribulation and all of that of uh, the church is not on the earth the church is in heaven so uh, another important point is to see that as Paul describes God's dealings with the church and Israel in Romans 9 through 11, he explains that Christendom will be in such horrible shape that it will look like Israel in their declension. And he actually will then take the church or Christendom as it represents God in the earth. And at the present time, no one would think of going to the Jewish people to find out what God's doing in the world. They go to the Pope or the Archbishop of Canterbury, or Franklin Graham, or whoever, they'll ask Christians about that. 
But there comes a point when these representatives are so corrupt themselves that God abandons Christendom entirely. And so the olive tree, which is representing God on the earth, is cut off. The wild olive is cut off. And then Israel is grafted back in so that during the tribulation period, people don't go to the church now or to representative Christians. Now they go to representative Israelites. There are the two witnesses. There are the 144,000. The scripture speaks about people coming and laying hold of a Jewish man and saying, take me where you're going. I know that you are leading people to God, so I'm going with you, right? So that's a very different shift between um, the church speaking for God at the present time and Israel once again becoming the representative olive tree in the world. Reason nine, because there are so many differences between rapture and revelation. Right, so at the rapture we read Christ comes in the air. At the revelation he comes to the earth to reign. In the rapture he comes for his own. There's no mention of the Gentile nations or the nation of Israel. He comes for his own. At the revelation he returns with his own. So at the rapture, it's only his own people that are involved, but at the revelation, everyone's involved. And it's then that we have this sorting out of the sheep and goats and so on. At the rapture, Christ comes to reward believers. There's nothing about judgment, whereas at his coming to earth, he comes to bring judgment. The rapture is linked with the judgment seat of Christ, and the return to earth is linked with the great white throne judgment. So there are many, I mean, some of these prophecy books have long lists of all the differences between the rapture and the revelation, and I think it's good to see those differences. Yeah, that's helpful. Number 10, our last point is because we are told to be looking for Christ, not Antichrist, and you touched on that a little bit earlier. Right, we have it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, that they're serving the living and true God, they're not sitting around, and this is an important thing. Sometimes the argument is made that Christians who are looking for the rapture, they're just kind of sitting on a mountain somewhere waiting. But that's not the case. The pre-trib rapture is a huge incentive that the time is short, and the work is great, and the laborers are few, so we need to get on with the project. So we're not just waiting, we're occupying until he comes. We have a limited time schedule here, and we better get to work. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there is that warning, verses 8 to 11, about not wasting time. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. So here again is this idea of waking and sleeping. Those who have died in Christ are going to be caught up first, and those of us alive will have our bodies transformed. Then we will gather together with him in the air. So I think it's good to finish with Christ's own words in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Because whatever you think the schedule is, it's going to happen. And we're going to see him, and we're going to be like him, and we're going to be with him forever. And that ultimately is the blessed hope of every believer. So whether we have the schedule right or not, the important thing is to be expecting him, to be busy for him, to be loving him, and he that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Let's not get entangled in the affairs of this life because we're out of here ASAP. So the scripture says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, you'll notice it doesn't say and receive you to my place, but receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So whatever your view, let's all join with the Apostle John and say together, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs>